We'll let people wander in as uh, they come in, but I want to make sure we get this in. My name is Ernest Hancock. I am the publisher of freedomsphoenix.com. Freedoms Phoenix started in the end, we went beta in like September of 05. And the reason was in 1996, when I was young, like a lot of you young guys back in my 30s, um, I had already by 20, in 88, I was like 27, 28 years old. And the realization that a lot of people since, you know, probably a lot of them since the revolution, since Ron Paul's efforts started in 07, you came to the realization that it's broke. You know, things are bad. And that was my realization when I had four young children married for a few years, had, we have children, and I could see that by the time my four children were my wife and I's age at that time, when we were 28, the country wasn't gonna be the same. There was legislation, there was, it was my father had a company that manufactured camping trailers for touring motorcycles, and when the travel restrictions, you didn't need a passport to travel around in Europe, all of a sudden, everybody wanted them. Fill up the sea containers and let's do it. Well, Dad, we gotta export America, okay? In 1988 election between Dukakis and Bush, the number one issue was flag burning. I mean, that was it, you know, we, we had the flag. The economy you know, was having problems. I could see that there was so many, James, there were so many um, things that were much more important that weren't being addressed. And I went on television, I started thinking I was being responsible by going ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, ABC, NBC, PBS, CBS. I mean, and it was the same five stories in the same order for 300 and whatever, 200 and something million people at the time in America. I knew something was broken and I came across and I, how did they get away with all this stuff? It was election law. They eliminate competition before it started. So I knew the voice of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, all the promises that they had given, it was a lie. Did anybody else know it? And the only people that understood this concept that there was something even broken were the libertarians. I didn't even know what a libertarian was, you know? The thing is, is that my wife and I, my family have been activists since 88. That's why they call it revolution. It comes around. And I wanted to analyze what the best thing I could do for my children and grandchildren. Because the deal that I made with my wife at the time, you give me 10 years. She gave me till 2000 and she re-upped and let me keep doing it. <laughs> I go, if you give me 10 years, I can at least spotlight the problems. I had no idea at the time, as bad as I thought it was, you know, I, I, it was way worse. And I could see it wasn't just America. Nobody's more enslaved than those that think they're free. And that was definitely America. So everything that we had done was building up to the promise. What I'm here to share with you is my impression as a promise to a little kid. I have my 11th grandchild coming. They know their grandfather as just, you know, any question, they go ask grandpa, go ask papa, man. I'm, I'm tired, my kids are like, go ask papa. He love, he got long explanations, okay? We're going video, we're going to the internet, we're going to find, you know, why is the grass green? I mean, you know, we're going to get it done. Well, I remember how impactful the events that were going on in the mid 60s. I was, I'm 56, I was born in 61. I graduated high school in 79. For some of you, that's a long time ago, but you know, for some of us, it's not, okay? At the time, there was a lot of promise. America, man, we're against the bad guys and we're the good guys. That's before the disillusionment of the Americans with Vietnam and Watergate and then the OPEC oil crisis and, you know, the Rust Belt and hyperinflation or at least inflation. And so there was a, a honeymoon period that when I grew up, there was the promise of a future that was unlimited. And the reason I wanted to give this presentation to you and after Colin and Jim, you know, inspired you with all the stuff that they're doing the technologists 
the people that understand technology, the people that create it, the people that inspire Generation Next, I wanted to make sure you understood how impactful you are from the impact it had on me. And a lot of people my age, you know, and even, you know, about my age, a little younger, a little older, that have created these companies that are changing the world. For what? What's the philosophy? And if we deviate from a decentralized philosophy, the promise of what America was, it'll go bad with technology in the hands of Big Bubba. It'll be like 1984, we're behind schedule, and you helped us with the tech, thank you very much. We'll get on schedule again. I do not want that to happen, and there has to be some way that I can influence, and this is what I do, influence the, just the m mindset. And I'll tell you, to give you a perfect example of it. When I wanted to help my father, my first impulse, there's two stories I want you to share, uh, share with you so you understand. My first impulse was to go to the blue pages and the white pages, back when there were phone books. I don't know if you guys even remember that. You know, in the white pages, in the front, there's a little sliver of blue pages. Well, in those blue pages, there's got to be a department if I get a permission slip, if I can do it. I got to, you know, my first mindset is to look for the permission slip or to fill out the form or the application for. When it used to be, the only purpose, that's why my show is Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock, three hours a day, five days a week. What happens is I am of the opinion that the Declaration made it very clear. The only purpose of government is to defend individual rights. When it doesn't do that, it's time to alter or abolish. It's real simple. When they violate that, you know, there's no justification for government to exist. We hear Roger talking about, you know, we're just going to go have this. We're not going to have a government. You can do whatever the heck you want. Peace out. You know, I'm, I'm good with that because governments always metastasize. In, in Arizona, we call it Steiger's Law, after this long story. Steiger's Law states that whenever you create an organization, a group around a movement or a cause, sooner or later, the organization becomes more important than the reason you created it. Not most of the time, every single time. So anything that you create has to be decentralized or it will metastasize into a rights violating piece of crap, but we're going to make some more money doing it and we'll do good with the money later, pinky swear. So my position is I just want to share with you a perspective. I love the V for Vendetta when he goes, freedom is a perspective. Well, I want to share my perspective with you. Pirates Without Borders is a web page that we created and we're still in development. It's been a year. It's pretty developed. We have the first letter of Captain Mark. Now, Captain Mark, as in Mark and Reprisal, M-A-R-Q-U-E, Captain Mark and Reprisal, his girlfriend, <laughs> that's going to come, she's the trinity to the Neo. Captain Mark, we started to understand, a lot of criticism, they go, ah, oh, you want to be pi pirates are bad, 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 bad pirates. And I go, no. Pirates weren't necessarily bad. If you had a letter of Mark from the king, you know, the king said, you can rape and pillage that Spanish galleon all you want as long as I get a cut. You know, and, but if you were against all flags, if you were independent, no, hell no, all the crown came. You're all, we all say you're a pirate. We're all going to take you out. Why? Because you weren't putting yourself subservient to their authority. So that's the concept that we want to get. And the categories, Freedom's Phoenix, we have hundreds of categories. I mean, it's just amazing, 200 and something thousand articles over the past, what, 13 years or something. And the reason we did it in 1996, Freedom's Phoenix is the phoenix rising from the ashes of Lady Liberty's torch. Because we knew there's an after. So that concept was in our heads as activists back in 96. We were waiting for video. When video hits the internet, oh, that'll never happen. Video on the internet, do you understand the bandwidth of whatever? And I was wondering why it took so long for my JPEG to download on the, you know, internet. So now they go, you're going to do video? And I'm like, well, it'll come. They just look at you like you're crazy. So when YouTube hit in 05, I go, boom, pull the trigger, Freedom's Phoenix, let's rock and roll. Now the concept was open you know, have the lefties have their say, right? I don't care. But it's edited and published by libertarians so that you get this wide radar screen of what's going on. 
so that you can see. Now, Pirates Without Borders is different. We took their, it's interlaced. Derek Slopey from Agorist Hosting has done a great job in, in, in um, lacing Pirates Without Borders with Freedom's Phoenix so that I can take all the best tech stuff, all the things that are going to be decentralized, all the things that's going to free us, all this technology that is there to empower the individual from the printing press, the internet, you know, the machine gun, I mean, whatever it is, the power in the individual to oppose the collective. When you have blockbuster movies like uh, you know, Braveheart and Patriot and Gladiator and Lord of the Rings and V for Vendetta, and you know, I mean, on and on, you go, what makes these blockbusters? It's the individual versus the collective. It's in here, and people spend their money for that feeling, rooting for the individual. So I'm, I'm thinking we're just being lied to. And whenever we do things like cryptocurrencies, like a lot of other decentralized technologies, people like us flood to it, and we'll move. So I wanted to demonstrate this. As a little kid, you see that tail fin. This is like, a, what is it? I think it's a 59 Caddy, you know, 56, 59 running there. Everything was rocket ship cars. And this was, an, and you're short. You're like five years old like this, you know, in the 60s or so on. I, I had all these cars. That's how I saw it. I mean, everything was a rocket ship. You go to the, you know, the, the tail, I think, are thrusters. That's a rocket engine, turbines to speed, Batmobile. Go, liars, that's an exhaust pipe. They're not really. I mean, so I kind of felt a little jilted. But, you know, this kind of feeling, emotion of the expectation. But what was going on at that time? What I learned later is, and I won't read it, but the main thing is when Eisenhower gave his military-industrial complex speech, if you read it and you watch it, it, that's, in my mind, that's not really what he was saying. That was a side effect of us being ruled by a scientific technological elite. He was saying all grants, all government money is spent towards the service of the state. The tinkerer in his garage is now replaced with a grant system. And it's there for the service of the state and not the individuals. And this metastasized into what we have now. And here's the allied commander, president of the United States of America. And he gives his final speech, and I warned you. And then you never heard about him anymore. He just went, you know, peace. And they kill Kennedy. So this mindset, that speech, if you read it, he was telling you what was coming and why. So... This is the atmosphere that we are in. Now, Forbidden Planet was 1956. What is this, four, five years before I was even born? And you, if you, how many people have not seen this movie? I mean, God, man, go see the movie, man. It's forbidden. It's awesome. It is just, and you know who the star, the Captain Kirk guy? Leslie Nielsen from Naked Gun. That was back when he was a leading guy, man. So... This was uh, Robbie the Robot. You've probably seen Robbie the Robot everywhere. But this is the stuff that's the toys that I'm playing with. This is the, the mindset that I had. And I want to give you, and then, of course, you know, the Jetsons came out, and it aired in prime time from September 62 to March of 63. Now, they did make some other episodes back in the 80s and so on. I mean, but, you know, the Jetsons, I bought the first season for my grandkids. It cost $30. On Netflix for me to have one season. For, I'm going, you, damn, you're make me do it, damn it, you know? Because I knew what the impact it had on me. So these are the things that are, and, and one thing I, I wanted to mention, um, Robbie the Robot uh, was reused a lot. And so it was the, the idea that you could have a humanity serving robot, you know? But now we're kind of worried about AI, and we'll get into that later. Now, during this time, what was going on? The space race was happening. Keep in mind, from the time I'm about five and a half years old, you know, it's like, you know, 66, 65, you know, we had the, the, um, the Mercury 7, we had Apollo, we had JFK doing the promise. Man, I'm going, we're going to freaking space. Yeehaw, man, I'm a kid, let's rock and roll. And these pictures of Earth rising, you know, the first times you could see the Earth from space, you know, a guy on the moon, well, we're... If we went, we're going to find out here directly because we're going back. And we're going to find out for you, just you know, just in case. Now Jim goes, we were there. Get over it, man. You know, so you know Saturn V. I have a little rubber keychain. It's about this big. It has a Saturn V rocket. My grandson has. That's like his thing, man. He loves that thing. 
This is I built, you know, um, uh, model rockets that had, you know, the two stage and they had the three parachutes and the three S, you know, uh, uh, engines that would go. And it was like this tall. I built with my father. I mean, you know, I was into it. Then in '66, here comes Star Trek. Oh hell yeah! You look at it now, and they digitally remastered it. It's very clear, and it's, it's really awesome. I watched the whole thing through when it first got Netflix, and I just watched it straight through, man. It was awesome. The thing is, if you really look at the sets, it's plywood and whatever, and people are, you know, but it held up. It's the lighting and the issues. I loved it. It was very inspirational. And we looked at all the things that they have in there, you know, except for transporters, as far as we know, warp drive maybe. Everything's coming. Then he had 2001 Space Odyssey like the next year. I remember going to the theater, what was I, seven or something? I'm going to the theater seeing 2000, now at the ending with all the kind of, I was like, what the hell's going on? But in the beginning, all this, what am I seeing? How a space station works, how you can do gravity, you know, how you're going to eat in space, you know, video phone calls, you know, the, the probes, the ships. I mean, I'm going, yeah, baby, we're going. Now, the ship that took him there, you remember when he was in that ship, what does it have on the side? Pan Am. You know, the space station was a Hilton. I wasn't thinking government. Of course we're going to go to space. We're going to make some money. Well, the Hilton, space station number five. So I, you know, as we look back on this, you just, you, you, you don't really remember. You're always thinking it's a government thing. It wasn't. NASA took care of that. I want, you know, the, it kind of looked like, you know, the, the spaceship. You know, it's kind of, you know, kind of, I'm going, hey, we got a space shuttle. Now, this is the Enterprise when they were testing it, you know, in this glide thing, and he put the, you know, uh, uh, bearing on the back. So this is the shuttle in the 70s. This is the shuttle in the 80s. And then in the 90s, I got the shuttle. And then in the 2000s, I got the shuttle. Okay, and then it's like, you know, 2000, I got the shuttle. I'm going, this is innovation on government. 40 plus years of dangling this little carrot in front of this little kid, you know, from an eight year old perspective, and they promised me those sons of bitches. So, what am I looking for? All of a sudden, the first flight of Falcon 9 occurred in June 10. There's been 41 launches. They started, you know, oh, they'll never be able to land the first stage. Oh, they'll never, they'll never, they'll never, they'll never, they'll never. You know how many times I hear never? So, any of this technology, I'm going to. I'm going to shock the crap out of some of you with the stuff that's coming. And you're going to go, yeah, but they would, oh, shut up. <laughs> I, I am so sick of hearing. I mean, if you can't imagine it, it's coming. Just the power of humanity's imagination. And that's what they're stripping from us. L. Neil Smith is a libertarian um, science fiction writer. And he was speaking at uh, one of the libertarian state conventions in Arizona in the mid-'90s. And he said... They need to strip the imagination from Generation Next. If you go to the supermarket, it used to have magazines that were, you know, this, that, whatever, and science fiction had its own category. You go to Blockbuster Videos, they had science fiction, had its own category. And he said, you watch, they're going to go away. Has to. They're going to just kind of take imagination out. Science fiction and blockbuster goes into horror action or whatever. You have the science fiction, go, the magazines start going away. You have, and I'm like, what the hell happened? Well, we got to deal with Now it's all Marvel comics or something. So then you go to the next thing. Here's Blue Origin. Now, I don't know if you know, Blue Origin is Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos has his own rocket program, and they're putting up and building big, and they're going to go, but, you know, um, he, he's tight with the government. You know, his servers, you know, they, they, they cloud source and uh, CIA. CIA's got the next drone strike right there next to my primetime video watching, okay? I'm not feeling warm and fuzzy about this one. So we got to be worried about this. But how? What do we do? Now, what started it, there's an inter international geophysical year was from July 57 to December 58. And it marked like Stalin had died. We're going to kind of thaw the Cold War. Science is going to bring us together. We're going to be one, you know, world kumbaya and kick butt. Now, of course, you have uh, the United States thinking, yeah, well, we're the guy. We're going to do it. We're going to do it government. We're going to do it government. All of a sudden, during this, you know, they develop and launch Sputnik. Now we got beep, beep, beep. Soviet satellite put something in orbit, ICBM of, oh, my God, and we got it, and we got to go kick butt. 
This was, it was government versus government. And at the time, like if you see October Sky or you, a movie about this time and, you know, people that were inspired by what Sputnik had done, it inspired the youth with the capacity and the freedom of mind to go and create what we have now in this country because of the inspiration of the Soviets putting it in space. That was the impact that I had, and they tried to beat it out of you, saying, they're the bad guys, they can't do this, it must be wrong. Now, of course, they're bad guys, but that's not the point. It was government versus government. Like, like our government's going to squash innovation and individual, and we're hoping Jim, you know, and Galactic Sky and everything doesn't have the government come explain it to them. Now, the first weather satellite uh, was out April 60, and... Um, it gave the first time that we could see weather from space. Now, I lived in central Florida. I remember my father, man, he was into it. He was there with his charts, and we're tracking hurricanes like you have now. We got, you know, and it, you know, it has an impact. Big giant oak tree came and crashed through my bedroom roof where I was and smished the top bunk, bunk bed where I slept. I was told you I got to sleep down on the lower one with my sister. And I'm going, I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what was he doing? He was tracking it. With what? Information from the satellite. Before this, how did you know what the hell was going on? This is not that. This is my lifetime. Then you have Telstar. Now, I thought Telstar was bigger. It was, Vor it was um, uh, I think, Voyager I was thinking of. But uh, Telstar is, you know, this big. It only took 14 watts it used, 600 phone calls. It had a one black and white television channel, and it was just a demonstrator, and it was only good for 20 minutes, you know, every couple of hours that you could do between North America and Europe. So they're going, ooh, satellites. Now, this is just a demonstration of what was coming. So then we have, now we got Intel Sat, which is, this was launched in August 12, and this, you know, provides, you know, everything. I mean, but they're big and they're heavy and they have capacity, but can't we do something with smaller? You know? Now, I want to explain this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on quantum entanglement because I don't understand it either, but I've watched a lot of documentaries, man. I mean, I'm trying to figure it out. Basically, it's this, as I understand it, and I'm sure you geeks will correct me, but if you create particles at the same time, like a light beam pulse or something like that, and you prism or you split them, split them in some way, they become entangled. You do anything to this one, it affects this one immediately at the same time, regardless of distance, faster than the speed of light, instantly. Here to Pluto, here to another star. Boom, they're entangled. Why? Because. As Einstein goes, you know, at a spooky distance, weird, I don't want to write a paper on it. I mean, you know, they knew it existed. Now, what happens is, all of a sudden, this theory could be put into practice. So what did they do? The Chinese put up a satellite. Now, this was August. This is just, a, you know, like six, seven, eight weeks ago. They put a satellite up, and they show the receiver and transmitter. And because these are entangled, they got instant communication that is not able to be tapped. You cannot, without you know, somebody knowing that you're doing it, and it's long getting the Schroeder's cat stuff. I mean, you, know, you don't need to go here. But the point is, is they have real-life practical application of this now. Well, you know, of course, I was a kid. I knew this. You know, because I saw it on Star Trek. Subspace communications. How is it that, you know, some episodes, well, it'll take three weeks to get back. In other episodes, they're like talking to, you know, the space station of Earth, whatever the heck. And I'm like, God, pick, man. Either it's a long ways away or it's not, you know. But subspace communications, all of a sudden you could see if you had the device with entangled channel of particles of whatever, instant communication. Not worldwide. Universe-wide. This is happening now, not later. All the stuff I'm showing you is kind of where we got the now thing. Now we got CubeSats. Now, now does anybody not know what a CubeSat is? As some people, you know, they, they you know, I, and I kind of tease it a little bit because the lower bottom left one is called a 1U, one unit, two, three. Then they start adding um, solar panels and stuff. And then I remember when OuterNet, a few years ago, they came out as a Kickstarter or something. They came in university. We're going to be able to make little satellites. So I'm going, oh, yeah. OuterNet, the concept was that they were going to be able to have these little dishes and hard drives and routers that you just carry around to the village in the Congo of the wherever, and you have it updated with the satellite. And you could have Khan Academy, all kinds of stuff that would go in, and then the router would go to all the tablets of the little village children learning anything about anything. 
So I'm going, boom, we're there. The internet, we're going, and in Pasa, when they were doing in Kenya, I was doing stories a few years ago, found out 40% of their, their gross domestic product was in cell phone minutes. Um, what? Because how many cell phone minutes does it take for an egg? How many cell phone minutes do I get for this dozen eggs? I mean, they were trade. All of a sudden, it became because, you know, the currency sucked. and not. So I knew that this was coming. Eric Voorhees, when he started Coinapult, you know, his mindset was they don't have smartphones. They got one billion flip phones around Africa. How can we help them be able to transmit value? Kind of, so I'm just, you know, this was coming. It's right there. But we got to maintain the right philosophy or it's all for naught. And that was, they were transmitting their first signal, I think it was in 14. Now they put, it's called, elect, there's different versions, but basically it's this. You know, and help, you know, thanks to Jim for making it a simple explanation. Is that if you have electricity can power an arc, like an arc that you get from welding, and you have magnetic field that can direct that, you got thrust. Now maybe the weight of a paper clip, but it's constant, and it's for a long time. It could be years. So you put it up in 300 foot, I mean a 300 mile orbit, and you can get geosynchronous orbits like 29,000 miles in a year and a half. I vote that. This is not later. This is how big they are. Medat's starting to take up some space. You know, we're, we got, a, you know, rocket launch systems, you know, they're, you know, they can put up, a, you know, 100 pounds, a few hundred pounds maybe. So, but, uh, you know, a lot of these guys, they're building for the big size. That's where the big money is, man. We want to we wanna go get some. It's big investment, big overhead, big, big, big. But, you know, we have these small satellites. Who's going to do these? And how many do they have to do? And they're still starting to take up a bunch of space. Well, they don't have to. Well, we just go smaller. These Femto... Um, sats now, they're just getting, hell, it's going to be dust you throw up. I mean, you know, this is how fast this is moving. In just a few years, it's getting this small. Now, these rockets that you have, you know, the Saturn V and their new uh, NASA super big whatever penis representation over there, then you have, it goes down to, you know, uh, you have Blue Origin, you have the Falcon different uh, conversions, you have the different ones that are putting up satellites now, and down at the bottom, there's Vector. What's Vector going to do? Somebody's got to launch these satellites. Now, a few weeks ago, um, Davi Barker, Bitcoin's Not Bombs, and I went down to meet at the factory. I wanted to see, I want to see factory. I want to see factory. Let's do factory. We did a three-hour show from there. Had a great time seeing them making. He goes, they make race cars. You know, and, and he goes to the guys. He said, you know, we're going to make, start making, we're going to start making rockets. You see that weld on that car? Goes, I don't know nothing about birth of no rockets. He goes, you, know, you see that weld right there on the race? Yeah, 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 just same over here. Let's go make it over here. So they started making them. Now, with this, the, sat, the cube sats, what's the realization? Hey, man, I can put up in orbit these. We make us some money. How much does it cost to do the launch? Not that much. So this is going to be a viable and enormous opportunity if you have a use case for it. And I'm sure you, you heard his talk. He's got a use case for it. So planetary resources started by Peter Diamandis that did the Anasari X Prize, the X Prizes for doing like a Spaceship One and uh, a Singularity University where they're do taking this kind of tech and they're developing it to bring it to consumers. Now, not only are they going to, it's DARPA for us, okay, instead of them getting to keep all the information. So they're going to planetary resources to go to mine asteroids. You put these CubeSats up or small satellites like what they got there. Now, you know, who's some of the guys that are in this? Like David Cameron, you know, from uh, Titanic and Avatar. You know, some big money, big explorer. We're going to be part. Planetary Resources already scanning the asteroid. And there's a lot of near-Earth asteroids I didn't know shared our orbit. You know, there's a, there could be, you know, like, you know, people killers, you know, one of these days. But the thing is, is there's enormous amounts of resources, and I'll take that palladium asteroid, thank you. But if you're hauling around gold and precious metals... You know, I mean, that's worth a lot of, that's a lot of weight. You bring it back to earth and what am I want? I'm not wanting to get paid in gold or haul that. I need some crypto, man. I need some weightless money. Now, what would George Jetson drive? Now, he had his car in his freaking briefcase. I'm a little kid, man. I'm like, woo -hoo -hoo, man, rock and roll is my flying car. I want my flying car. I'd be on the air. I'm going, flying car, flying car. Yeah, yeah, that's all interesting. Flying car. Where's my flying car? Then people started sending me. Well, here's one out of the Netherlands. Here's one out of this. Here's one. All of a sudden, I found out they're coming. We'll go over that a little bit. 
the PAL V first flight was in March 2012. It goes like 100 uh, miles an hour. It's got a couple hundred mile range, air or ground. That's the street conversion. It pops up. It's a gyrocopter. You just go out and you're off. The flying drone car, they introduced it at the Consumer Electronics Show each year I go as a journalist. And uh, they have, you know, different things. It's kind of, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not really interested. I like going in the basement of the Venetian where you have all these kids with the new tech. And they had the Ehang 184 there. It started service flying testing in Dubai, July. And you just ordered on your smartphone. Uber comes, flying Uber without a driver. You get in, I want to go here, it lands, you're done. Uh, now, not later. The other, one of the other ones I like, oh, this one. Now, the Lilium, this is the two-seater version, and this is remote. They didn't have anybody in it, but it has, April, has just took off, and what it is is ducted fans that are direction, it's all electric. This is working now. They're building a five-passenger one now. These are coming now. Now, the Aeromobile, the one on the bottom left was their first prototype, and now they're selling this, and it folds up, you know, and it's kind of, you know, I'm, it works, and it's a flying car, and it might, you know, get you the second date, but, you know, it's not that great. Now, Terrafuega had one that had folding wings that came out, and it was ugly as hell. You, you ain't getting the first date with that one, you know, but it works. So they came up with this. It's um, uh, electric-powered. It has the drive fan in the back. It has these pods that come out from the side. They tilt up, vertically takes off, lands, you drive. Now, this is kind of cool. Now, I, I put this in my driveway, you know. Now, this one, the Project Zero, this was done by some engineers, and there was a company that uh, Augusta Westland, the management said, we're going to take our engineers, and we want you to put all the electric tech into a flying airframe that can take off vertically and land vertically, and uh, we're not worried about battery capacity. We don't care. It does 10 minutes. Right? We'll worry about batteries later. We're not waiting on the batteries. We need to build the airframe. Get it done. Yeah, we'll worry about batteries later. Boom. They come up with this thing. I, I, I'm really impressed with what's been happening. Now, we publish an online magazine. We have a newspaper and so on, and we do a lot of covers. We have like 40 different artwork. And the point on the left one, I'm thinking, what if we had this decentralized, leave me alone you know, non-aggression principle attitude from the time we came to America? Well, we'd have, you know, Native Americans integrating us and have carbon fiber teepees and satellite dishes and, you know, with pace. It was Rivendell, man. We live in a good, nice, of, you know, uh, environment that we'd have be one with the earth. If we had the right philosophy, can we do it now? To the right, there was another car that had, uh, you know, a plane, flying plane. We kind of designed, put a little funky doodles in it. And here's a valley with all of these different domes and structures that have airships, putting them in building out in the middle of the, uh, you know, uh, 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 Roger Ver's place. You know what I mean? So this is going to be able to happen now. Prefab of nice mansion of, you know, because why? Because I thought of it. That's why. Because it's going to happen. Now, here in Shelter, we have, um, this is called Wiki House. And it's just a concept. What they wanted to do, instead of designing for the 1% of the whole world's population that can even, you know, buy on time a house, you know, how do you empower individuals to do it? How do you bring, you know, democratize it down to the individual to build something? On the top right, that's a 4x8 sheet of plywood. To the left, you'll see in CNC, they have the designs for an entire house, and all you do is feed it plywood. And then you put them together. It's Tinker Toys. This is happening now. Now, they license it through, crea through Creative Commons. It's open source. Anybody on the planet can do it. Rock and roll. We make geodesic domes. Now, there's Adam and his crew came in. That's my barn on the side of my house. And we started with, we called it the money dome. Some of you have gone to Pork Fest and so on. You may have seen it. Then I have an aquaponics thing. It's the side of my house. And I created a double put together aquaponics system. That's when we first started building it. And we did this because it's cool. But then I'm going, man, going, you know, pressing, hammering, drilling. Man, that's a pain in the ass. And you can't really see it, but it's behind the second guy there. It's a big stamp press with a die. It goes boom, and it punches the hole, rounds it. You got the end done. We can make one of these domes in an hour and a half from EMT conduit to dome 
boom. This last uh, pork fest, we did a 23-foot, like, two-story dome. Davi Barker and I did it in two and a half hours. Done. This kind of mindset, but what's the problem? I can make a bunch of these in one day in $5,000. I can make my own village, put it on a trailer, go up in northern Arizona. Won't you be my neighbor? Till the man goes, I'm sorry, man. Did you get a permission slip? They always got you geographically. You're always paying taxes. You're leasing your land from the man. They're going to tell you how the sustainable development of the EPA, the standard of the draw, and you can't collect the rainwater. I mean, I am so sick of this. How do we get away from this? It's up here. So then we started in September 12. We did each magazine would have a theme, you know, power, uh, self-sustaining, you know, medicine, uh, you know, uh, growing food, educating your children, and we have a cover that kind of go with it. You know, it was like a year and a half later or so, I'm going, we don't want to have power for big cities. I need it in my freaking garage. We need to decentralize everything. We need to not be so, the, the people in, you know, the high rise of their great and wonderful over there looking down and this, and if that one power station goes out, one nuclear power plant, they just had another earthquake off the coke of Fukushima, what, yesterday or the day before? You know, I mean, decentralization is the key. So here we have the way the power grid is now. It's all, you know, centralized. You transmit. You go. I'm like, no, 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 no. We got now 13-year-olds building nuclear fusion reactors. This is, I, it's amazing if you know what question to ask in your search engine. You know, what do I want to learn about today? What do I want to see on the news? What do I want to see how far we come on? I would put it at, boom, there it is. We put it up on Freedoms Phoenix. Then all the tech that I think is co, oh, we put it in top tech news, or we put it in the different categories of Pirates Without Borders. This is, in, is to inspire. It's, and they go in, we'll have different companies and energy companies, and they'll go, Oh, you don't want solar. That's bad for the environment. Look at these little kids getting these minerals that, you know, needed for the solar production. They're exploited, you know, little kids skinny in the African blah, 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 and it's bad, and it's not green, and the batteries got to go to the landfill, and blah, 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 blah. I'm going, yeah, you're confusing me with someone that gives a crap. Now, of course, I, you know, don't want to have a dirty environment. I don't want exploited people. I mean, I, that, that, that's not my point. My point is... I choose these alternative energies for their decentralization traits, that they're not on the man's grid. Right now, we've been doing coverage of uh, Texas and Florida. We've had libertarians there. They're out going and helping people and don't need permission. I got chainsaw, and the man can suck it. It's not like what happened in New Orleans. There's a little bit of it. But New Orleans, 600 bass boats show up to go save the people on the roost, and a FEMA guy with an M16 said, no, you're not allowed. Oh, yeah, and we want your guns. <laughs> So I'm, no, no, no. So now in Florida, all of a sudden, I'm ready to go buy some solar panels. You know, I want to get a bunch for project, you know, putting our studio on solar. We got it all wired, but I need the panels. All of a sudden, they doubled in price. Why? Because half of Florida is without power. Oh, and we'll get around to it one of these days because we're not just putting up the lines. We're going to put a whole new system in the central plan of you definitely get a smart meter. So they're going to wait. So some people go, no, no, I'm not. No, I, I'm, I'm getting me a Tesla power pack. I do myself. I get some panel. I'll do it, you know, rock and roll, and we're done. Then they find out it is illegal in Florida for you to have a solar-powered house that's not tied to the grid. And when the grid goes down, you can't use your solar because it'll power the lines, they say, and kill the workers. Now, so I'm going, you got to be kidding me. In Arizona, same kind of thing. I tell you all kinds of stories, spend all day on it. But the thing is, it's the decentralization that they're afraid of. Because once you get off, you're freaking off, and they know it. So this is my lab in my barn, another part of where we you know, make the domes. I have a little area. It's probably like a 15 by 15 area I kind of cordoned off. And I, popular science, this is like October of 29, and um, Norman Rockwell did this. Uh, painting or this uh, illustration there you'll see on the wall about Yankee ingenuity. Get to your workbench, man. It's rock and roll. It's, you know, it's the future. So I kind of copied that and I took my lab and I put it in there and it all represents different things. What I was doing was this. Years ago, a friend of mine, he's a power plant, plant supervisor, refueling supervisor for Palo Verde in Phoenix. 
he's a good libertarian, you know, ran for Congress, making fun of the bad guys, and he's just an activist, one of my best friends. To be closer to the plant and not have to, you know, rush hour traffic, he buys nine acres out in the desert. It was going to cost him $30,000 just to hook up to the electricity. He goes, screw you, I'll do it myself. Backup generator, windmill, bunch of solar panels, and batteries that he put down in, uh, you know, he built a bunker thing for it to be cool. He's been there 13, 14 years. And I've gone through the innovations, new inverters, new panels. They get a lot cheaper. Their cost way less than what it was back then. He's like doubling his capacity. Hell, I can run window shakers now. Pretty soon I'll be able to do an HVAC. That's very good in Phoenix, man, I'll tell you. So he calls me and he says, yeah, I'm, I'm on my third battery change out, uh, lead-acid batteries. And a zombie apocalypse comes four or five years, man, I'm screwed. Uh, I need something that's last long. What does he find out? Nickel iron battery called Edison batteries. The old cars, the electric cars. Jay Leno's got them in his garage. He's driving them on the same batteries. You will them to your kids. But they only made them in China. Why? Exide batteries bought up all the manufacturing for nickel iron in the 70s and closed the plants. Why? Because they can. So now we have... China started making nickel iron, iron batteries again. He orders them, takes them, puts them in. They've been there for four or five years, and they don't degrade. You can charge them. You can discharge them all the way down. Where lead acid, you got to buy 1,000 amps because you only discharge them like half, or you'll mess up the batteries. Nickel iron, you can go all the way down, so you only need to buy 500 amps instead of 1,000. So he's been doing, and I go, what if? Because I remember popular science, popular science in like 91, and I raised my children. Three of them are in aerospace of my four kids. Wants to stay at home mom. Because I told him, I go, look, it's materials. It's the future. It's going to be, man, you making it and doing it better. So they're doing well. Because I understood carbon is coming. And then all of a sudden, carbon nanotubes hit. And I go, what if you can grow carbon nanotubes, plate them with nickel, you have enormous surface area, and you can charge and discharge and rock and roll. We're doing some battery. When I checked on it before, it was like seventy, eighty thousand dollars for me to get the stuff. China got you know tube furnaces that I needed and different stuff, and I do it for seven thousand. I'm like, boom, we're gonna do it. So I started growing carbon nanotubes using acetylene. You heat it up to about eight hundred degrees Celsius. You break the hydrogen and carbon bonds, vent the hydrogen. You know, get a catalyst. You grow this nice little black velvet. You plate it with nickel. I put it in. I made a bath. It's a long story. That's the bottom thing. I did. Boom. I got you know it charges fast. I go cool, Ernie. It's called the Battery Project. You go, Ernest Hancock Battery Project. It's one of the most popular downloads, and I haven't touched it in over a year. How come you're not doing it? And I go, hey, I just wanted to show you could. I want to buy them. I don't want to make them. That's work, man. I got other stuff to do. You know, so it's inspiration because I knew the government was going to start patenting carbon. They wanted, oh, yes, this is a DARPA University of the I'm going, no, no, no. I see where this is going. So I needed to do this just to stop it or just inspire people. So then we did on innovations, and what she has is just, it, it, it's cornucopia of, of our ingenuity. It's just all, you got the fire and the sail and wheel and, and spinning and uh, uh, 3D printers and Mr. Fusion and the neuralizer and whatever. If we can think of it, it comes. That's my point. And you'll start seeing airships everywhere. You know, we always have going, the airship things are coming. So we're thinking, you know, what, what do we do? Do we stay or go? You know, how, and go where? What, what's the future? How are we going to, so we did an edition on that. Now, this is September 11, one of the early issues in the first uh, six months or so we were doing the magazine. And we had, you know, uh, uh, Spaceport USA over there on the left, and you have the Phoenix, you know, going off. You have seasteading kind of stuff was going, airships, and small classrooms are teaching a few people how to be somebody. And this is what it's about. Generation next. It's the youth when they're young. It's the inspiration and the discouragement that happens when you're little. So we want to defend the geniuses of the future from force this. They want to analyze and control and make you whatever. And, and, and it's, you know, it, what's the difference? Why is the, you know, the Nazi youth and the Hitler and uh, Stalin this and that, and now you got junior high? I realize when I go to speak to schools, you do the elementary kids, and they'd be like, you know, 
yeah, this is cool and fun, and, you know, and you kind of give them some concepts about freedom and whatever. High school, you're like, yeah, this is cool and fun, and they in, engage, but they've been kind of propagandized, and they got their own. By college, they're going to tell you how it is, and you got the fight between the anarchist and the, you know, the socialist and whatever and so on. It was junior high. Seventh and eighth grade, I talk and I go, what do you, I see the clock. The first time I did it, you know, how it goes tick. You know, on the clock, it was two minutes. So I started wrapping up and going, so what do we need? What do we need more freedom, right? You know, it's more freedom. If you, this happens, what do we need? Freedom. We're going to get freedom. What's the answer? Freedom. We need this one. Freedom. Ding. They're marching out, going in the hallway. Freedom. 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 I did classes all day. After lunch, I come back. It was the art teacher came in with a camera, and she puts it down. She's all stomping around. She, I'm going to get them on tape. I've got these guys chanting, freedom. Couldn't believe it. She was so upset. Now, the teacher that was there, she's like thinking it was cool as hell, you know. So this, I could see why they chose junior high, to have junior high. That's when your social studies, that's when your government this and the rules of and, you know, I'm just a bill and this is how it works kind of crap. Because they're questioning authority and it's dad, we got their program, go turn them in. They got to direct that questioning of authority. It's not us, it's dad or mom or whatever. So I could see why they do this at this age. Look at the age of these people. You got to save them because they want to do this. Might as well be a robot. But what if you can just skip it? Hey, man, why don't you just skip the indoctrination and just chip them? Think it's not coming? It's in the water. It's in the air. It's in your vaccines. It's this, that. They're changing us because they have to. The human spirit will not be denied. Yeah, go watch Gattaca. <laughs> so this is my mindset. I'm going, I could see what's going on. I tra and we pulled our kids out. My oldest was in uh, third grade when we pulled our kids out of school. We went private school. We homeschooled and chartered, and then we did private school. And, uh, you know, a lot of money, a lot, but it saved me a lot of problems. But two by two, hands of blue. This is from Serenity. River Phoenix, what was her crime? She was super smart, super capable, and super had to be in control of the man. So the man comes up, two by two hands of blue, you in service of the state, or you're sure as hell not in service of yourself. I can see it coming. So why am I still so optimistic? There's a lot of stuff. I'm a, you. I was waiting on you. I, mean, I was waiting on you. Because I'm not as smart. I'm not as educated. I didn't have a lot of the opportunities. I, it doesn't come fast for me. I'm not, I'm not an Eric or Colin, okay? You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, or Derek. I mean, all, there's so many of you guys. I hate this. I shouldn't even said a name. <laughs> so then we're thinking medical. You know, we have, you know, uh, we gave a little ode to free aid here when this was going, uh, they were starting up. And we're going, what kind of technology could we have? Well, they had an X prize for the tricorder. It was, you know, they, I think it was $10 million they gave out. And the number one winner was $2.5 million for a smartphone or a tablet that has a device. It's a tricorder. Why? Because going to space, you're going to need medical diagnosis and help and doing that. Man, I'm not taking a big, giant, freaking CAT scan. That costs money. So they're starting to develop this stuff now. I was burned in 94. I have skin grafts from my leg onto my arm. I could have benefited from this. It's a skin cell spray gun. They take, and it could be bad, and boom. It's amazing now, not later, how many of you even knew this existed? Why? I want to slap somebody. I just don't know who, and I don't care. I'm not even, I'm past that now. Just screw them. We're just going to, you know, move to whatever. We're just going to do it ourselves because we can. But damn it, Jim, now you know why you hit spray bottles. <laughs> <sighs> I was like, what the hell is the spray bottles for? All of a sudden, now it makes sense. <laughs> how to make a heart. They take and they wash any structure, because a lot of times the stem cells develop from the structure, the shape or whatever that it's in, the collagen, that they wash out all the donor um, cells and they just put stem cells in there, boom, and they grow hearts. They've installed, transplanted in 06, they started doing bladders. A woman had a damp from tuberculosis, had a damn in trachea, she was a young woman, I think she was like in her 30s or something, or late 20s, and they grew it, stem cells, um, they put it on a washed out trachea and planned it, boom, problem solved. Now they're talking about full body or head transplants. 
How the hell are they going to do that? There's like a, a glue that connects the nerves together, and they, you may have to relearn how to walk or something. But they're starting to work on this now. There's a China saying they're going to do the body transplant, and this Russian guy, you know, he has an undeveloped small body in a wheelchair. He's willing to do it. They're going to be doing this. This is December. They already done it in monkeys. Have a monkey head taken off, put on the other, and I can go to the detail and whatever, but you get it. We're going to be head hunting now. Now it gives a new, new, new term. Now, of course, they, I know they did They already did it on TV. You know, so I'm like, yeah, I'm just waiting. Now, they did it in Star Trek. They just changed out his brain. Remember that episode? You know, some aliens stole it. So McCoy goes in the uh, get really smart machine, and he did, you know, put it back. Star Trek did it. It's going to happen. Star Trek did it. Star Trek did it. Damn it. You know, so there we have, now they're talking about taking your consciousness and uploading it to an android. Elon Musk just started a company here recently that's all about the neural interface between our brains and computers. Regardless of what you think about that, if we don't do it, open source, and we all can participate and get the information, DARPA's doing it, and you'll be a victim of it. That's just the way it is. So interstellar travel, you know, what does that take? You know, cryo, we're going to, you know, go and be and go somewhere and something. Well, they already did it. You know, they just, in February of 16, they took the first mammalian brain and thawed it without damage. A rabbit's. So, of course I know they do. They did it on Star Trek. <laughs> There's Khan. They do it on Star Trek. It's coming, man. That's just the way it is. So here we have, from one of the Iron Man, I think it was the second or third one, you know, Elon Musk does a cameo, and I remember this scene. He goes, hey, Tony, I got an idea for an electric jet. Yeah, we'll get on that. Boom, and he goes off. Really? Of course. Their planet, all you got to do is get the energy density. You know, all you got to do is the weight of whatever. I mean, you know, it's just, a, you know, and, and well, how long we got to wait? They've already done it. Now, not later. Want to build your own Iron Man helmet? Well, Elon's going to show you how. <laughs> a few years ago, he came out with this. They used a Connect, you know, a Microsoft Connect, you know, kind of gameplay thing, and it recognizes your hands, and you manipulate in 3D, and you cut down into it. You can look inside of the products. You can sit there and design and do and print. Hit print, and that's a titanium. Um, now, pump, fuel, some Jim, tell me what it is. It's a, it's a piece of a rocket. <laughs> Yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, this, this is what my sons do. They were at Honeywell. One of them went to another company, you know, super gizmo gadget maker. And that's what he got a job offer at SpaceX. The problem was he goes and he says 197% of the living um, cost of living than Phoenix. You had to vaccinate your children and you couldn't have guns. Next. Move it out of Hawthorne, man. So they're already starting to plan and do this. They, we did a, a, um, a Honeywell family day, and we got to do a tour, and they took us in with the lasers, and they're making this stuff. This is now. Shelter, Bigelow Aerospace. Bigelow owns uh, Budget Suites, Hotel, Motels, that guy, all right, out of Vegas. He paid, I think, like $70 million for the Russians to launch his own uh, space station, and I'm going, you know, how did we not know about this guy? This was Genesis 2. Genesis 1 was launched in 06, Genesis 2 in 07. It went on the International Space Station as a module in 16. You have two private space, they're small, they're just demonstrations, and he's going big. You already saw, you know, he's already starting to build, man, rock and roll, let's do it. Two private space stations in orbit right now. How come every seven-year-old kid doesn't know this? How come you don't know it? So this is what it does. It inflates. It comes in a small area for launching. Go boom. Well, you can use that for a bunch of stuff. They had space stations for rent. To small countries want to do some research or companies or whatever. You can go on, you know, interplanetary moon base alpha, of, you know, right now. Now we're going back. Google, uh, uh, Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, the deadline is, keeps getting pushed back a little bit every time because they got five companies and they're all want to make sure everybody's ready. And this is the deadline is March 31st of this next year. 
We're going back to the moon. And you get, I think there's up to $30 million in prizes and so on. They have five uh, rovers that are going. You have to travel 500 meters, half a kilometer, transmit transmit back high-definition video and images, and uh, it qualifies you for whatever. And there's some other benefits too. Why? Because the one reason that Elon wanted to go to Mars, he's going, look, man, I have the window, and you got the Mars red landscape. He's the Martian. And you put a little water in this little tub, and it goes, bing, and you got a little green sprout. You know, who wants their logo by that? Pick me, pick me, pick me. Bitcoin to the moon or something. You feel me? You got green on Mars? Man, somebody's watching. He's going to have that. It's going to be a picture all over the place. NASA knows this. Here's an astronaut, ma'am. Come on, please. Give us money, man. We've got to do it. Yeah, it's about freaking time because I'm waiting for this. I'm, you know, six years old, and this is what I was promised. You know, Pan Am's going to take me to the Hilton. When? Well, we did articles on it. <laughs> we talked about it. What's, you go to the top of freedomsphoenix.com right now. At the very top, you'll see online magazine. You can go through, we had like 36 issues up there. And it's just, it just you know, mapping all this out. So how far are we from, you know, the you know, X-Men aircraft carriers? You know? Is it a now, not later thing? We started in, uh, Hurricane Sandy happened in October of 12th. That December issue, we demonstrated that I know the air, it's just a duh thing. It's a 12-year-old going duh. Especially with carbon fiber, nanotubes, lightweight, new materials. My, I mean, I name off a bunch of them, but uh, we have an airship comes in to survivors uh, with medical aid. You have hovercraft comes in with the food. You have flare craft down there, which is another technology I'm a fan of. And they're bringing ammunition and arms and make sure you're all stocked up. You got the energy guys. You got the flare craft, the big one. That was the real Russian one that was done in the 60s. A jet plane that flies just above underground effect this high, it's a fast ship. Then you have to go airborne. Well, these flare craft can carry enormous weights and go very quickly across, and they're starting to you know, uh, provide ferry service in a, a lot of countries around the world, especially in Asia. So, and then we had on the top left, that's cop block security. On the top right, that was free talk sat. <laughs> So we're showing what would happen when voluntarists have the ability and just the man out of the way, what will we do in these disasters? We'd come help. You got voluntarist symbol on the uh, bulldozer. So that was the point we were making. Aeroscraft is one of the companies I'll show you is doing this. The Hindenburg, these are the things you need to remember. 804 feet long. It's like, you know, two and three quarter football fields. It was enormous. But it, because of the material they made it out of, it only had 11-ton lifting capacity. You make them lighter, stronger, they can lift a lot. The capacity um, was 11 tons. You had, uh, uh, it went about 80 miles an hour. It had a crew of, um, I think it was 40 crew and up to 70-something passengers. And, you know, in that another number, what is that? Oh, yeah, 1936. 1936. Are you freaking kidding me? Of course, they had the Hindenburg and the hydrogen. Well, one, you can do helium. And Rift Valley just found a bunch more helium, so we're good. But you go up in the stratosphere, where you think the helium went? It's got a band in the stratosphere just sitting there. I got all my helium. Thank you very much. I'm done. I go get it. So I'm, I've, 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 and what made the Hindenburg burn was the aluminum coating that it had on it anyway. The bottom right one is one that's now. They call it the flying butt because it looks like Kim Kardashian bent over if you look at it the right thing, you know. But the, um, I mean, literally, they compare it to Kim Kardashian. So it's called um, the Lockheed uh, butt, whatever it is. The, uh, so this is what's coming. Down here, Eros has already have, you know, these are people, all right? So this is big, but it's a prototype. This is what they need to do. Yeah, I want Gold Rush. Everybody, anybody watch Gold Rush? We're going to get to that mountain if we could only get our little dredging thing up. The kind of, boom, here you go. Now, this is what Canada is doing. Reuters in November 16, you know, uh, Canada is tired. And it's, hard. it's hard. I mean, you only got a few months they can fix their infrastructure. Your bridge or highway goes down. When are you going to do it? You got ice road truckers. They're waiting for the roads to freeze so they can drive on it. You know, with airships, boom, done. 
Done, 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 done. So it's happening. Halo Airship of the future, there's a company out of the United Kingdom that builds and designs luxury yachts for I got more money than I know what to do with Mr. Sheik, what's his face. And I'm gotten, you know, building these big giant these gazillion dollar yachts. Well, hell, man, we'll build you an airship that you can take your ship on. These are enormous capacity, and the halo comes down. That's where all your speedboats and, and scuba gear and everything is. I go to Narcopoco. I'm out in the bay, man. Pace. I live on my house. I travel with my house. And they're getting bigger. Now, of course, who wants this? The military. Here they come. How many tanks can we take? Is that where we're going? Are we looking for a military contract? No. And it's going to be overwhelmed. I mean, with just the need for everybody else. But what did you not know? Secret airship. Sergey Brin also wants to fly. Why? Because Larry Page has a f secret flying car company that just came out. He's building his own flying cars because he can Got the money. Sergey's like, no, 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 no. He's already got, it's the, uh, how would they call it, the Macron, the Macon. It was a large Navy blimp that they had airship back in the day, and they had the big hangar for it, you know, uh, in Northern California somewhere, to where uh, Sergey bought that, and that's where he's building it. Their budget, I think, is $150 million to start, because they're going to start making him some airships. And I'll do some, yeah, we're going to live on it, and we're going to go around the world, and, we're gonna, and we'll do, it's a humanitarian ship. I'll take some, uh, you know, food to somebody somewhere one time and get some press. But he's living on it. So you think I'm, how far out do you think this is? You go to space. It just floats up however high you can get it, you have, you know, solar powered, you can do whatever you want to do. And what if, but if you got to get to a meeting, man, you're late for work. Well, you know, they've already showed that in October of 12, space jump. You guys remember that? Well, of course that was coming. I saw it on Star Trek. <laughs> you know, I mean, what do you think was going to happen? It's imagination. Why would they even think to do it? It's just, it's a challenge. It's, a, it's 12 year olds and everybody. <laughs> Now they're talking about having reentry vehicles for doing the atmosphere of Titan, Saturn, Vegas, I mean um, Venus. So this whole thing is, it comes in, it does its heat thing, it pulls it out, boom, and now you're in the upper atmosphere of various planets doing, or here. This is coming. Now this was June of 2004. The Anasari X Prize, here comes Spaceship One. Spaceship One is getting launched, and I'm like, oh, hell yeah. We're going to space, and government is so freaking not invited. So we made up six signs. That's one four-by-eight sheet of coroplast, and some of the signs, two of them had sayings on the back. So we had six sayings. In the bottom left, I went, when they were parading the vehicle, I went with the Spaceship One Government Zero, and Bert Rattan ran over and grabbed it, and he goes, I got a, thanks for coming, Eric. I got a message for the media. So he grabbed it out of my hands. He runs into the press room, and that was the press conference there with that. Now, Jim was there. You know, back in the day, man, he's like, yeah, yeah, who did those signs? Now he knows. The future brought to you by Free Enterprise. That's in the hangar with the billionaires as we're sitting there having some fun when they're showing off the vehicles. And I stood there for two hours, kept changing out signs. Because I had the opportunity, because I wanted to make sure that they understood there was support for no government. Now, Bert kind of had this idea, too. This picture went around the world, everywhere, except the United States. We were in German, China, Italy. It was amazing. But the government zero thing? Oh, hell no. You're so not allowed to say that. And I'm like, man, we are not invited. That doesn't mean they're not going to come, but you got to catch me first. So anarchy, pirates without borders, man. Anarchy is only 62 miles away, 100 kilometers. We need to start thinking three-dimensionally because anywhere on this planet, 62 miles above sea level, man, that is where governments don't have any jurisdiction. There's no sovereignty. So, God, is it already time? Okay, I'm going to whip through this. So we started the Precariat. We wanted to design, we got to have a pirate ship. 
So here it is. It's that's that's sea containers, the shipping containers down in the bottom right there. We got a pirate cove. You know, Captain Mark and Reprisal, belay that order, belay, not obey. And we got our own fighter. I'm talking space stations orbiting Mars, mining asteroids. We did a deal on that. Freedom's Phoenix is breaking free. Are we breaking out, breaking other people out? What difference does it make? Let's just get free. And let kids have their dreams. Just be an inspiration. Do be decentralized. Don't compromise. Serve the rights of the individual so you won't have to be replaced. And belay the state.